The suggested gospel lesson for today, once again from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. 
They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what they, their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. You have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Hmm. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's easier to say that after some scripture readings than others, this thanks be to God. Some scriptures are hard to hear, hard to read from the pulpit. I became a United Methodist pastor in June of 1991. The Sunday before I walked into my pulpit as a pastor, I had been a lay speaker for two little churches in Denton, uh, First United Methodist Church, Clear Springs. And I remember standing in the pulpit on my last Sunday at First in Denton before I was going to be the pastor the next Sunday of Allegheny, Limeberry, Pine Hill, Pleasant Grove, United Methodist Churches in Denton. And I remember John Oakley stood up in the congregation at some point in the service. John was a retired United Methodist pastor. He and his wife, Ola, had First Church as their home church, so got to know them well over the years. And John stood up and he said, well, Randy, I guess I'm, I've been elected the spokesperson for the congregation. I just want to thank you for all you've done here. We've appreciated you being here for the last two years. I can't think of any bad comment I've heard about you. Nobody has said anything bad about you. And then he paused for a moment and said, of course, now the Bible warns against that. John obviously had in mind these words from Jesus. Woe to you when people say a bunch of nice things about you because that's what their ancestors did to the false prophets. I thought over the years, and I've been fortunate, people generally have said nice things about me, but I've thought over the years when I run across those negative comments, which I do run across from time to time, obviously, sometimes not to me, sometimes around the bend they get to me, but I've always been... I wouldn't say enjoyed those comments, but I've always gone back to that text and thought, okay, well, maybe I'm not in as much hot water with the good Lord as I could be if nobody had anything negative ever to say. This is an interesting bit of Scripture, isn't it? It's not a particularly easy bit of Scripture to hear. I've been preaching for 27 and a half years, a little more, and I suspect, for the most part, People who have sat in the pews while I've preached in Denton and Lexington and Clemens and Salisbury and now Highlands, North Carolina, for the most part, if we were to really be honest with ourselves in this text, we find ourselves in the woe rather than the blessed. And that's not an easy place to be. I think coming to this text, whether you hear it as good news or bad news, depends on where you're standing. And so I come to this text every time it rolls around, every three years in the lectionary, I come to it with some, some hesitation, some regret and fear. I re recall the words of my old homiletics professor, Dr. Andre Reznor, who once told us as preachers in a homiletics preaching class, the Bible wasn't written to give you sermons. 
And some texts feel more like that than others. So what's a preacher to do with a text like this? And not just me, you're on the hook for this too. It's your book as well. What are you, what am I, what are we to do with such a text? You know, it's much easier to stay with Matthew. This is Luke's version of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, which we know well. And in Luke's telling, it's the Sermon on the Plain. Luke has been up on the mountaintop praying all night. After the all-night prayer vigil, he has chosen his 12 disciples, apostles, he names them. They come down from the mountain, and then the teaching begins. And in Matthew's gospel, we have these beautiful uh, beatitudes. Sometimes we refer to them as the beautiful attitudes. These are the ways that we are to live our life. Luke's a little different in the way he gets into his beatitudes. Where Luke says, blessed are the poor, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Where Luke says, blessed are you who are hungry now, Matthew says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matthew's a little more concerned with spiritualizing the message. Luke is more concerned with real on-the-ground poverty, the kind that makes you beg, plead, and the kind of hunger that makes a baby's stomach swell. That's what Luke's talking about. And Luke adds this section that I really wish he wouldn't have added, these woes. Matthew doesn't have the woes. It's all blessed and beauty in Matthew. But Luke juxtaposes the blessings with the woes. Woe to you who are rich. You've received your consolation. Congratulations. Woe to you who are full. You're going to be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now. You're going to weep and moan. And woe to you when people speak well of you. That's the way they treated the false prophets. That's John Oakley's favorite part. So this text is not without its challenge to folks like us. Now, if you find yourself this morning in those places of brokenness, if you find yourself in those places where, uh, of, of deep poverty and deep hunger, if you, if you really are in those places, this does offer some really powerful good news to you this morning. If you spend time in Luke's gospel, you get this real sense that Jesus came for the poor, the impoverished, the broken, those who were pushed to the outskirts, if you were with us a few weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' sermon to the home folks. We went back to Nazareth. Remember that? When the home folks tried to throw him off a cliff, they enjoyed his sermon so much. You remember that? And Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah. Do you remember what he read? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to bring good news to the poor. So from Luke's vantage point, as Luke interprets the life and teaching and ministry and the death and resurrection of Jesus, it is God standing on the side of those who are disenfranchised and vulnerable and outcast and marginalized, the poor and the broken. That's who Jesus came primarily for in Luke's gospel. The people who have been on the back of the bus in Luke's gospel will one day be at the front. Some scholars refer to Luke's gospel as this, uh, having this eschatological vision, end times vision of a grand reversal. That everything at one point when the kingdom of God comes in its fullness will be flipped. So those at the back of the bus will be at the front. Those who are at the front of the bus will be at the back. The weak will have power. The power will be weak. The rich will uh, be poor. The poor will be rich. I mean, this grand reversal, this switching of tides, if you will, and depending on where we find ourselves standing today, that's the key to whether we hear teachings like this and we embrace them or we hear teachings like this and it sets our teeth on edge. Everything in the Bible is not easy to hear. It is not easy to preach. So I wonder what the message is for folks like you and me. 
I remember when I was at one church that had been broken for a, a significant amount of time before I came, and, and I remember trying to navigate that season and really kind of wrestling with what it means to be the pastor in the midst of a broken church. And so uh, one thing I learned about that season, when you recognize that the task before you is bigger than your skill set, when the job is bigger than you, that's when you really start to find out how much you need a good prayer life. I spent a lot more time in prayer in that season, I believe, as a pastor because I knew I was in over my head. I had too many broken pieces to put all the puzzle back together, and so I spent a lot of time in prayer in those days. And I remember on several occasions, five or six or seven occasions, I received what I still claim today, the word of the Lord in a time of prayer, and the word of the Lord that just sort of formed in my spirit, a word, a phrase that just seemed to be what I needed in that moment that I've, I've often looked back to over the years. One particular word of the Lord moment for me as I was praying about this fractured landscape I had landed in, I felt in my soul these simple words, the way things are now is not the way things will always be. The way things are now is not the way things will always be. I thought about that as I thought about this text. I think that's it's part of the word of hope to those who are poor and those who are hungry and those who are weeping and mourning and those who are persecuted for the sake of Jesus. The way things are now is not the way things will be. In Luke's understanding, there is this flipping of fortune. There is this flipping of fortune because of God's favor upon those who are not favored in this world, not favored in this life. You know, I, I got to tell you, as a, as a white male heterosexual, I have always stood in the dominant norm wherever I've been. I've always been in the status of favored. I don't know what it's like not to be in the places where people are not favored. I try to be sensitive, but I don't know on a personal level what that's like. So I hear a text like this and I think when Jesus says, blessed are you who are broken and blessed are you who are, who are put down, blessed are you who are poor and you're hungry and you're mourning, I, I think I, you know, I have moments when I mourn, sure, I have moments when I feel maybe a little bit persecuted, just moments, but boy, when he shifts to the woe to those of you who are full now, to those of you uh, who, who have plenty of money, the, those of you who are, who are laughing now, those of you who, who are the toast of the town and people say nice things about you, look out. Woe to you. It's a hard and harsh teaching. Now, you may be hopeful that the preacher today is going to make it all better. You may hope that I have the power to with some clever use of language, and I, I know my language, okay, but you may be hopeful that I can somehow schmooze that thing to make us all feel better about ourselves. You may be hopeful, but let me disappoint you in love, beloved. Somehow I don't think that's honoring Jesus. I think there are some texts that just need to lay heavy on our hearts. I think there are some texts we ought to wrestle with a little bit. I think I shouldn't spare you in the coming week of the wrestling I've been doing in the previous week over this text. Maybe the text that Richard read for us this morning helps us a little bit. Jeremiah's text this morning speaks about cursed are those, woe to those, if I can sort of use the Lucan language this morning, who, who trust in themselves, who trust in themselves and they don't trust in God. Blessed are those who really trust in God. And I do think maybe there's something to be said that when you are poor and when you are grieving and when you are hungry and when you feel persecuted, I think maybe there's something to be said for in those moments you have a real keen sense of your need for God. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses said to the children of Israel before he died and they went into the land of Canaan, the land of promise, Moses gave them a word of warning. God has fed you in the wilderness. 
He's cared for you in the wilderness. You have been dependent upon God in the wilderness, and now you're going to be planting your own food and eating of your own harvest and living in your own homes. Be careful, Moses said. Lest when you find yourself in a place of prosperity and self-sufficiency, you forget the Lord your God. There is something about when things are going well that it's easy to buy into the notion that it's because of us. It's because of our strength. And we may think less about our need for God. But find yourself face down in the dirt, breathing in the mud without resource or hope or help, and you understand clearly your hope is in God. Maybe, maybe that's something that's going on here. But I'm still very mindful of this grand reversal that really is at the theme of the Gospel of Luke. And I can't help but wonder when Luke gives us blessed and woes, and if most of us find ourselves in the place of woes, that there is a word for us. There is coming a day that is very hopeful for those folks who find themselves broken. If Luke is right, if Luke's theology is right, there is coming a day when all injustice will be righted. There is coming a day when God's fullness is revealed in Christ. There is coming a day when those who are hungry will be filled. There is coming a day when those, when those who weep will be able to laugh. When those are uh, now pushed to the outside will be on the inside. There is coming a day when those folks who have been starving will be front and center at the banquet. Those who have been ostracized and pushed way out in the field somewhere, in the periphery, there is coming a day when they will be welcomed. That's the word here. But for those of us who've been spending most of our lives at the front of the bus, it is a challenging word. I, I think maybe, for me anyway, it's helpful to, to bring more images of Luke into this text. Later in the 16th chapter, there is this parable that Jesus tells. It's an interesting parable. It's kind of a strange parable. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's the parable of the dishonest manager or dishonest steward. It's an odd little story. Jesus tells the story. Only in Luke does he tell the story. A rich man had a manager who was overseeing his property, and word came back to the rich man that the manager was mishandling the property. And so the rich man calls the manager in, give an account of what you're doing. I'm going to let you go. You are fired. And so the manager is terrified. What am I going to do? He says to himself, I'm too weak to dig. I'm too proud to beg. What will I do? My master is kicking me out. And then he has an aha moment. Oh, I know what I will do. I will make friends of the people who owe my master money so that when I'm kicked out, they might welcome me into their homes. And so he goes to one, how much do you owe my master? Uh, 100, uh, uh, 100 gallons of oil. Sit down and, and change the bill, make it 50. And to another he goes and says, how much do you owe my master? Uh, 100 barrels of wheat. Sit down and, and change that to 80. And he does this with several people and the rich man gets word of this and he's not angry. He actually commends the dishonest steward. He he commends him because he is shrewd in his business dealing and Jesus gives the moral of the story at the end of it. He says, be sure you make friends with mammon so that those who have uh, the opportunity may welcome you into eternal homes. The, the point being, again, this idea of this grand reversal, make friends of those who are lower on the ladder than you are because someday they might be able to put in a good word for you. A little later in the 16th chapter, it's the same thing. There's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You know that story? The rich man dressed in purple, eating sumptuously every day. Kathy and I went to, uh, a brief aside, Kathy and I went to uh, uh, Pigeon Forge for a couple of days, and we, we stayed at the, uh, uh, we stayed at the uh, inn at Christmas Place, and they have like the biggest breakfast buffet like ever. And Kathy had for breakfast pecan pie. You can imagine that. And so uh, it was more food than we could possibly eat. 
And, and I ate more than I, and I certainly should have. I mean, Kathy, besides the pie thing, she still didn't eat very much. I thought about this text as I was eating. I didn't stop eating, but I thought, man, I've just, I've just, you know, I, I know what it is to be full. I mean, I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to have more than enough. And well, the, the rich man ate sumptuously, maybe even better than the breakfast buffet at the inn at Christmas place, but he ate sumptuously every day, dressed in his, his purple robes, while outside the gate, as Jesus tells the story, there was a man by the name of Lazarus, and he was hungry every day, and his best hope was just to get a crumb or two from the rich man's table. He had sores all over his body, Jesus said, and the dogs would come every day and lick the sores on his body. As Jesus tells the story, Lazarus eventually died. And he was carried by the angels to Father Abraham. And the rich man died as well. And he was carried down into Hades where he was in torment. And he looked out across the gulf and he saw Father Abraham with Lazarus by his side. And he called out to Abraham, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus to dip his finger into water and touch the end of my tongue, for I am misery in these flames. And the king said, oh, my child, or, the, or Abraham said, oh, my child, I'm sorry, for in your life you had your good things, and now you're in torment. And Lazarus suffered evil in his life, and now he is comforted. I wonder, I wonder, if the story might have been different for the rich man had he ventured out of his castle, his palace, and made his way to the gate. I wonder if it might have been different for the rich man if he would have welcomed in the beggar at the gate, put salve on his wounds, his sores, invited him to the table, and let him eat something besides crumbs. I wonder if that story might have been different somehow. I wonder... If there's something in that word that speaks to this text. I wish I could make this text all better for you. I, I wish I could make it sound more like Matthew, but we, I think, need Luke in on the conversation. And to not pay attention to Luke seems somehow less than faithful to Christ, I think. And so we live in the tension of this. And maybe, maybe here's where we are at the end of the day. Maybe what we need to hear from this text this morning is that God favors those whom the world does not. That God stands on the side of the weak and the suffering and the broken and the outcast and the vulnerable and the marginalized. And for those of us who don't fall into those categories, maybe the best thing we can hope for is the mercy of God. And maybe the best thing that we can do is to be mindful of those whom God favors so that we can favor them too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.